for people who want to kind of calculate the offset into segments of the video, it is starting at 9 a.m. Right. All right, it is 9 a.m. So I'm gonna get started here. Um, I got a few things to share with you guys. You know, I you know, put these on the announcements already, but I'm gonna mention it anyway. So if you go to announcements, I got a few items here. So this is how I can kind of kind of keep you guys up to date well, over the weekend. Um, for some reason, the video is not very stable. You know, if it keeps flickering, I will do something about it. Could be the refresh rate you know, that is an issue. Um, first of all, you know, I put in the binary addition and subtraction module. So I know I said, you know, maybe last week I said, you know, okay, let's not go into binary addition and subtraction, but it turns out I have to do that because later on we're going to have to talk about binary comparison and all the flags, you know, after a comparison. And I can't talk about that unless I have binary addition and subtraction already discussed. Do you guys back there have any questions for me? Nope? Okay, because it looks like you guys have some questions for me. All right. Very good. Um, and then I have a little bit of observation of the lab submissions. Um, not everybody got you know, four out of four points. I mean, everybody got some points okay, you know, in this class, but not everybody got four out of four. And, you know, um, and I think you know, being able to run the test driver is important because you know, the test driver is exactly how I graded the assignment. So when people name the circuit you know, with a space between um, like, cer uh, what is it, uh, gate one and gate two, if there's a space in between, the program is not gonna be able to pick it up. Um, if the pins are off you know, a little bit, it's not gonna be able to pick it up. So why am I so picky about these things? Looks like you know, I'm just being a little anal on your know, details. Well, when you go to work as a software engineer, and the specification of the API is this is the name of the method and these are the parameters in this specific order and you decide, I don't like this order, I'm gonna change it a little bit. How do you think that's gonna work out? Your boss may not like it, right? Because your, your API, you know, when it's finished, is not gonna interface with uh, the other people who, who need to use the API. So we have to be exact you know, when it comes down to what is already specified in the specification. Now, if I don't you know, give you the specification, then obviously you have the freedom to move things around. Like all the components within the circuit, that location, eh, you can move it around a little bit because I didn't specify that they have to be at a certain place. Um, this one is kind of interesting. Uh, it's a formative, uh, you know, does everybody know what is formative as opposed to summative? No, because you guys are not teachers. Yes, go ahead. It is, um, it's more about being gradual instead of, you know, I just give you the most difficult problem to solve here you know, to begin with. So formative assessment tend to be a little bit easier. It's, it's more gradual. It's all based on you know, exactly or immediately what you have learned instead of, oh, you have to learn all of these things and know how to apply all of that in order to you know, get a good score. I have to say that the midterm and the final exam is not going to be formative, it's going to be summative, which means you, know, you have to learn and be able to apply all the things that you have learned in order to solve problems. I'm basically testing your problem solving capability and not whether you know something or not. Why? Because the exams are open book and open notes. I don't have any doubt that you can find the information. The question is can you apply what you have learned? So that is you know, kind of the one of the things in my classes that is kind of important. But you can go check out this, okay? Check this out. Uh, hmm. I think this class should be fine. I have to fix it for the other class. So it's a question and answer kind of session. Um, I particularly use, I, spec I specify to chat GPT to use the HTML elements called summary and details. So that's why you, know, you can kind of click on it to know the answer. So this way, you know, you can just go ahead and attempt to answer the questions and then compare your answer to you know, the actual answer provided by ChatGPT. 
If the answer provided by ChatGPT is wrong, let me know <laughs> so I can go ahead and fix it. Um, but this is all AI generated based on the material from all the way at the beginning, which is last Tuesday, all the way through um, binary addition and subtraction. So give it a try. Um, it is um, just my experiment of how you know, I can you know, have chat GPT to come up with questions so that you guys can assess you know, how well you're understanding the material in this class. If anyone is interested in how, what kind of prompt I used to generate these questions, you can actually click on this link here and it will show you the details of how I use your know, ChatGPT to generate these questions, which may be helpful to you because you, know, you might say, okay, so if once I learn how to prompt ChatGPT to uh, create these questions, I can tailor you know, that to my way of studying. Okay, you can turn the dial, right? You can, you can say ask more difficult questions or ask easier questions or ask me questions that only test my knowledge of things and not so much how well I can apply that knowledge. So you can turn that dial any way you want. Do we have any questions about you know, um, the chat GPT gen AI aspect of doing all this? No. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? <coughs> Okay, I see some nods. All right, okay. So this is all extra stuff, you know. Um, you don't have to know how to use your know, chat GPT in this class, but I'm just giving you some additional tools so that in the process of studying, you know, you have some extra tools to do it. Our exams will be on paper only, no electronics, you know, in the midterm or the final. In other words, chat GPT cannot directly help you in the exams, period. It is all you, okay? But that has always been the way that I you know, conduct my uh, the assessments of my classes. All right, but it is open book and open notes, which means you know knowing how to um, gradually come up with your study guide before the exam is important. So who's responsible for your study guide, me or you? In my classes, it's you. <laughs> I'll give you some pointers of how to do it, you know, but it is you who is gonna come up with your own study guide. So I'm not gonna provide a study guide. What I will do is I will go over the exams from the previous semester um, so that I can at least talk about how, what the questions are, what they're really asking, and how to solve those problems from the previous semester. I also have a reputation of not recycling questions so that means it is not gonna be exactly the same for you this semester, you know, the kind of questions, but it will be, they'll be very similar. And certainly they will be the same scope, but the, the questions may be asked in a different way. So you have to kind of mentally be prepared for that. And when you take notes in class, you also have to kind of make sure that you take good notes, you know, so that you don't lose your thoughts, you know, when you're in the lecture. All right, so that's that. And we are now going back to the lecture material. All right, so if you just come in, you know, you missed the first you know, eight minutes or so, um, it's not directly actual class content. You can always watch the video to find out what I said you know, in the first eight minutes. Does everybody know where to find the videos? Okay, I see, a, I see nods, okay. So if, okay, okay, so I think you guys all know how to find it. Um, the videos should be available like 10 minutes you know, after the end of the lecture, which means by the time you start the lab, it should be available already. All right, so we are moving on to, well, we'll, we'll go ahead and finish your no, uh, values, numbers, and bases because you know, today's lab is on this topic. And I'm starting to incorporate um, AI generated questions within the module itself. So at the end of each module, there will be some questions for you guys to kind of try to answer, just so that you can get, a, get an idea of how well you understand the material. Uh, this one is not too bad. Um, the, sometimes your know, chat GPT does not actually give me the correct answer. It can formulate the questions just fine. But when it comes down to the actual answers, chat G, chat GPT even 4.0 oh, 
can be dead wrong or wrong in a very obvious way. So that's why I have to check with the answers you know, that is generated. All right, so within this section here, there are a few things that are super duper important. So the first one is this equation here. What is it doing? So typically in a math equation, the things on the right-hand side are the ones that are known. So that means you know, D, B, and the D and B are the ones that we know. And then we are trying to figure out the value of that is specified on the left-hand side. In this case, the, what is on the left-hand side is V, which is the value being represented. And these symbols here are related to the number itself. Can somebody tell me what D of I means? And I can be just basically an integer. It can go negative, it can go positive. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so it's one of the digits, and which digit? Yeah, go ahead. Yep, it's the, I wouldn't say it's the i-th digit because you know, that's very, that's ac that can be confusing. Um, I would say it is digit i, okay? So digit zero, digit one, digit negative one, and so on. And that is multiplied by, oh, what is b? What, what is b representing in this equation? It's the base, okay? So typically we use base 10, you know, when that's the base that we are familiar with, but it can be, B can be two for binary, it can be seven for base seven, can be eight for octal number, can be 16 for hexadecimal numbers and so on. So that is one of the important equations. And then the other one is down here. So once again, you know, whatever is on the right-hand side of the equal symbol represent things that we, that we are given with, and the one on the left-hand side is the one that we are trying to find. In this case, what is V again? It's the value, and then B is the base, and then what is B to the power of I? What is I? I has the same meaning as the I from the previous one, which is? It's the position of the digit that we are interested in. So in the previous one, I give you all the digits and you want to figure out what I is. In this one, we're doing exactly the opposite. I give you the value, I give you the base, I give you the position of the digit, and this will, this part, the right-hand side, will give you the actual value of digit I, given the base that we want to convert the value E into. Are we good so far? So of the entire module, these are the two most important equations. Um, if you're taking notes, I hope some of you are, you want to put all the equations, all the important definitions and equations to one spot in your notes because that makes it very easy for you to look up the definitions. And if it's easy for you to look up the definitions, then you can quote unquote understand the material better. What exactly is understanding in a class like this? If, you, if, you, if I ask you, do you understand this material? What does that actually mean? Am I asking, do you understand every single word in the module? No. The general concept? Okay. That's a, that's a good, good way to explain it. But what I really am asking you is, can you connect the different concepts? Okay. What is the base? What is the number? What are the digits doing in the number? What is the value being represented by a number? Those are the individual concepts. The equations are basically a mesh to help you connect all of those things together. So the question is, do you understand how things are connected by the equations? Okay, so that's, um, so that's understanding. So understanding is the connection between the concepts. Okay, all right. And it does have some questions for you. You know, it, you know just kind of go through this. This time I asked your chat GPT, to generate three categories of questions. There's easy, medium, and hard. So there you go, you know, go give these a try. They're not gonna be graded, um, but nonetheless, I think it is important to give this a try. Do we have any questions about base conversion? Because this was from last Thursday. No questions? Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Where you want to store that, um, and uh, how does the feature uh, 
You mean this, the application of this one? So V is the value, and then you divide it by B to the power of I, and then you take the floor of that. And yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, I do, but we can also work on it today, too. You know, so we'll go ahead and work on that problem today. I hope this is still connected, because sometimes it'll, it loses connection if I don't use it for a while. Like now. <laughs> uh, okay. So let me fix this problem first. probably a setting where it does not try to reconnect to LRCCD by itself. Okay, so now it's good. Do a refresh. We good. All right. So the example that I was showing is I want to convert 123 in base 10 to something in base 7. That's the one you're talking about. Okay. So which digit is the one that has a concern? Because I can use that equation to work on digit zero, digit one, or digit two in this case. Digit one, digit one okay. So we want to figure out, so I is one, B is seven, because we're converting into base seven, and then V, which is the value, is 123. So we're we good so far with what is on the board, okay? So now we want to figure out what is D of 1. So D of 1 is the floor of V, which is 123, divided by 7, which is our base, raised to the power of 1. Take the floor of that, and then you want to mod this also with 7. So what we end up here is 127, 123 divided by 7, because 7 to the power of 1 is just your 7. So that would be a 1 followed by a 53, so it's a 17-point blah, 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 okay? Take the floor of that mod 7, and the floor of 17-point something is 17 itself, very good. So we have 17 mod 7, which is the remainder of 17 divided by 7. So what is the remainder of 17 divided by 7? Okay, yep. It is consistent with the two, three, four base seven representation that we worked out earlier. Is that okay? All right. So this is the application of that equation that figures out only one of the digits in a certain base. It doesn't figure out all the digits at once, but it figures out a particular digit in a number. Is that okay? All right. Cool. All right. So with that done, we are moving on to a much more interesting topic, which is binary addition and subtraction. How do we add and subtract numbers in base two? So this uh, this is rewritten, okay? It is, you know, in today's term, re-imaged, okay? Because I cut out some of the most important things, one, well, okay, one said most important, but the most difficult parts of you know, how we use you know, a circuit to perform addition and subtraction, but I kept the most essential part so that you know, I can use that material later when we have to talk about comparison. So that's why it's a trade-off, okay? You know, I got rid of some of the stuff, but we'll get to that later. So we'll start with addition, and we will start with something that you're familiar with, which is adding in base 10. So I'm going to change this one here, okay? You know, because you know, this format looks a little weird to most of you. I think it should, because you know, the way the carry is represented is it has its own role in the table. So what I'll do is I'm gonna copy this on my tablet and then switch to my tablet and do it in a normal way, but I'll explain it in a way that connects to what you're seeing in this table here. All right. And let me switch back to the tablet mode here. There we go. So we have 752 plus uh, 249. I'm going to ask this, even though I already know, know the answer, but I'm going to ask anyway. Does everybody in this class know how to perform multi-digit addition in base 10? In other words, do this using a piece of paper. 
Do we have any questions about that process? So we argue with this, okay? So we're gonna do it, okay? Um, the way I was taught, okay, because the only disagreement is where do we put that carry out one, okay? Because it depending on when you go to high school and so on, you know, that can be a little different. The way I was taught is two plus nine is a one with a carry of one, right? So what is the whole concept of a one with a carry of one? Why don't we just say that you know, two plus nine is 11? Because 11 is a quantity that is more than what a single digit in base 10 can represent. And that's why we have to break it up and go like, well, okay, if I can just kind of push that quantity of 10 to the next digit, my neighbor, what is the leftover that I have to deal with, right? So you go like, okay, since two plus nine is 11, we're gonna say the next digit, go ahead and handle this extra one here, which is actually the 10. But 11 minus 10 is one, so what I need to handle with digit zero is the remaining portion, which is just a one. Is that okay? All right, so now we go on to the next column, right? You know, the five and the four. We go like five plus four is a nine. Good, no carry of one. But then we have to remember to add nine to the one because this extra <coughs> one is coming from the carry of digit zero. Is that okay? So nine plus one is 10. And can we represent 10 even a single digit in base 10? Nope. So now we go like, ah, okay, we have to carry again. So whenever we carry, we're basically saying, I cannot handle this entire quantity, okay? So I'm gonna give the next digit the 10, and I'll handle the remaining portion. So now we have a carry of one, but the remaining portion in this case is simply a zero. Is that okay? All right, so same thing happens in the next column. Seven plus two is nine, okay, we're good so far, but nine plus one, is 10 again, which means I have to carry to the next column again. So now I have a zero here, and I'm going to put a carry of one over here. And that is the end. In other words, the <coughs> sum has the same number of digits as the two numbers that I'm adding, because when you're doing this inside a computer, every integer only has a fixed width. The sum doesn't get that one additional digit so they can handle you know, potentially a number that is too large to represent. Is that part okay? Does everybody, does everybody understand why the, the three numbers, I call this X, I call this Y, this is S for sum, X, Y, and S, they all have the same number of digits. Then we have a problem, or so it appears, because now it looks like I'm saying 752 plus 249 is one. Well, that's partially what I'm saying, but I'm also saying there's an overall carry of one. This is my overall carry. The overall carry is in which position? Is it digit zero, digit one, digit two, or digit three? three. It's digit three. So that one is not representing just one. It is representing one of what? Since it's a digit three, 1,000, because it's representing one of 10 to the power of three, which is 1,000. So th the actual value of this, the, the sum, or the result of the addition, is 1,000 plus the zero, zero, 001 that is actually explicitly represented as the sum. 1,001, oh, that sounds about right. Okay, 752 plus 249 is indeed 1,001, but it's just represented in a really weird way. Are we doing okay so far with the base 10 addition? Okay, so I will switch back to my notes here. I have to walk a little slow today because I have a condition called a gout, okay? You know, so it's a little painful for me to walk around, so I, I just have to, I have to do it slow. Okay, yep. All right, so the way I do it here, okay, you know, let me just, okay. I cannot really do the same thing I do, but I really like to walk around in the classroom when I'm teaching. So I'll do it kind of slower. So it's the same thing that you saw earlier. The only difference is instead of putting the tiny little one over here, it has its own row. That's it. Okay. <coughs> and then the uh, 
the letters of these rows is important too because I want to come up with a systematic way to name each and every digit involved in this multi-digit addition. Because once I can figure out, once I give these digits each a name, I can be systematic about it. Because the whole idea is, I know how to do this, you know how to do it, I don't even have to teach you about this. But the, the thing is, I want to teach the computer how to do it. I want to design a circuit to do it. So I have to somehow come up with a generalization in order to describe the, the, the way of how thi this is done. So that's why naming is important. We know x, y, and f already as the sum. So in between, we have q. The, the row of q is what I call a single digit sum of x and y, okay? Because one is the single digit sum of two plus nine, nine is the single digit sum of five plus four, and so on. Does everybody understand what I mean by a single digit sum? It is the sum of adding two digits of a particular base, but we are not dealing with the part that has, that, that has to be taken care of by the carry. This is just the remaining portion of the, the sum. So are we good with that concept? Okay. So as it turns out, the sum or the sum row, each digit is also really just a single digit sum between the Q and the K. Because one plus zero is a one, nine plus one is a zero, nine plus one is also a zero. So the only row that is difficult or slightly more challenging to express is K, okay? K stands for carry, but since I have a function, you know, C for carry, you know, for the naming of the bits, I use K instead of C, okay? It's just, you know, to make sure that I'm, I don't run into a collision of names, okay? So this portion here is generalizing, you know, the uh, partial sum or single digit sum and also, you know, how do we compute the carry. So when you look at the uh, Q row here, how do you come up with the value of the Q row based on the values of the X and the Y? Well, the easiest way to do it is to say X plus Y mod whatever the base is it, it is. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's why, you know, in C++ code, the R function, which has U and V as single digits of a particular base B, or in this case, base 10, is simply add those two together and then do a mod 10. Is that okay so far? All right, what about the carry? Well, the carry is a little bit more obscure. It is U plus V is greater than or equal to 10. You go like, okay, but that should give you the answer already. You only need the Boolean expression here. Why am I turning this into a, how do we call this again? Using the question mark and the colon in C++ C++ and most other languages? Ternary, okay, this is called a ternary operator. The question mark and the colon is called a ternary operator. So the expression is a ternary expression. How do we interpret a ternary expression in this case? What does it do? Go ahead. Yep. That is correct. So the ternary expression in C, C++, Java, and everything that is derived from C, so that would also include JavaScript and a few other languages, is the first thing, which is to the left of the question mark, is a condition. It is interpreted as a condition. If it is true, then it will return the value that is between the question mark and the colon. If the condition is false, then it will return the expression to the right-hand side of the colon. In other words, it is an if-then-else in an expression. Is that part okay? All right. So it's a very handy way, you know, because I don't have to use if-if-if-else, okay? Um, and you might say, you know, but how hard can it be to use if-else? Well, if else is nice, okay, but it is a statement. And you cannot embed a statement into a place where a value is expected. For instance, a parameter, okay, or a, part, a larger part of another calculation. So personally, I prefer to use ternary expressions when it can sort of be done by you know, the same way using a conditional statement. Are we doing okay so far? So the next question is, okay, now that we know what the question mark and the colon are, why do I have to do this? 
isn't it the case that a condition that is true is a one automatically, and we don't really have to coerce you know, the, the true to return the value of one and the false to return the value of zero? Let me ask you, what is considered true in C, C++? This is from the CISP 360 class. Anything that is not zero is true. So that means, so when you look at the type of the return value here, it is unsigned. Be it's not a bool because this is C and not C++. In regular C, there is no Boolean type, okay? How many values do we have that are not zeros as an unsigned? We'll, we'll just assume the unsigned is 16 bit, just to make the calculations a little bit easier. So how many possible values can you have using a 16-bit unsigned integer? Okay, we have zero, one, two, three, four, and all the way up. All the way up to where? With 16 bits. Two to the power of 16 minus one, very good. So there are two to the power of 16 values, unique values that you can represent using 16-bit. One of those is zero. That is false. The rest are all true. Which means if a compiler is to be C compliant, all it, all it needs to return for this expression here is anything other than zero. There are 65,535 of them. <laughs> and you have no idea which one the compiler said, I'm just gonna choose this value to mean true. You have no idea. Now, do they normally use one to represent true? Yes. Do they have to use one to represent true? No, not according to the specifications of the language. That is why, to be safe, I always want to coerce that to be just one versus zero. Yes? Well, it's just you know, the notation makes it a little bit easier to express. So right here, there we go. So Q of I is the R applied to X I Y I. S of I is the R applied to Q I K I. Remember, R is just a single digit sum. Okay, that's basically what it is. But K of I plus one, which is the K of the next column, is a little bit more complicated. So why do we have a plus here, and why does it depend on both X I Y I? and also QIKI. Well, we get, all we have to do is to go back to the example here. In this base 10 example, this area of one is because of X and Y adding to more than 10, more than at least 10, I should say, at least 10. Does that make sense? But this one over here, which is um, digit two, K2, is because of the QI plus the KI being at least 10. Does that make sense so far? So that means there are two ways to have a carry of one. The, the carry of one can be because of the digits in the numbers that you're adding, but it can also be because of the single digit sum and the carry from the digit before. Both can contribute a carry of one. Is that okay? All right, so I picked this particular example because it really shows both ways that you can have a carry of one. Do we have any questions about the two sources of a carry of one in just basic base 10 addition? We're okay with that, okay. So right now I'm using a plus here, which is you know the simplest way to say, oh, it can come from here or it can come from here. But what I did not address 
here, which I'll address later, is, hmm, with all the cases that I have encountered, it's either or. It can never be both at the same time. In other words, you guys can probably confirm this too. You have never seen a case where the carry, you can have a carry of two to the next column in, a, in an addition, right? So the question is, is it just because all the, all the ones that I have worked with, or is really the case, okay? You cannot possibly have a carry of one coming from XIYI and a carry of one coming from QYKI at the same time. So we'll address that in just a little bit. Is that okay so far? Yes, go ahead. So, um, like when dealing with base pairing, mm -hmm. because you know usually you carry it in the same place. So w when you when you add straight down, it should be added straight down without the um, carry. And I guess like for I mean I guess for seven fifty two two thirty nine, it would just add uh, the two on the bottom for each the one right after it because they can carry it again. So don't use that. That is correct. I can give you another example. Do you want me to work on another example? Yeah. Uh, go ahead and give me the numbers that you want to add that can help illustrate what you want me to illustrate. Uh, um, Susan, Diane, Sophia, Rebecca. Uh huh. And. Six hundred and twelve is not going to trigger any carry at all. Do you want something that will trigger a carry? Yes. Okay, so I can do a. Um, oh, we can we can make it, make this a little, a little more interesting. How about this? Okay. All right. So now we have x, y, q, k, and s, right? And as I said a little bit earlier, okay, that's an implicit zero here. We'll put it here. So q is just the single digit sum between the x and the y. So I can just compute all of them at the same time because one plus nine has a single digit sum of zero. One plus nine has a single digit sum of zero. Three plus zero has a single digit sum of three, okay? K zero is a funny one because unless this is a continuation of another addition, then it is by default a zero. So K zero is a zero usually, okay? Is that okay? Yeah. Because we don't have anything to contribute a one to K zero. Uh, K of one, which is here, is the carry between the one and the nine over here, plus the carry of zero plus zero over here. One plus nine has a carry of one, zero plus zero has a carry of zero. One plus zero is just a one. Um, same situation over here, one plus nine has a carry of one, zero plus one has a carry of zero. One plus zero is one over here. We get so far? So let's work out K3 too, because K3 is actually important, which is you know, the one that goes that's supposed to go here. Three plus zero has a carry of zero. Three plus one also has a carry of zero. Zero plus zero is zero. So normally we say there's no carry, but in this class we say we have a carry of zero. There's always a carry. The question is, is it a one or a zero, okay? So now we work with the S row. The S row is the single digit sum of the Q and the K. Zero plus zero is a zero. Zero plus one is a one. Three plus one is a four. We do not have a single case that we have to use the actual mod operation, or the mod operation does not exist in S row. So does that help? the pattern of how we perform base 10 multi-digit addition and then see if I can extract the pattern and then change one thing out of that entire pattern and go like, okay, now we have base 2. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. So Very good question. Eleven really takes a one to get to zero. So 
okay so far um, the symbol the, the use of symbols in this class and also my 440 for those of you who are taking 440 also in the same semester can be difficult to grasp okay so what you really need to do is take notes go through examples relate the concrete examples to the use of the symbols okay that is how I would do it okay and then put all the definitions you know, in one place in your own notes Okay, because that way it's easier for you to look it up. So if I were to switch back to, do, 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 to the notes here, oh, not this one, this one. So that means in this case, I really want to put um, the definition of R, the definition of C, and then the definition of how QI, SI, and K of I plus one, I would put all those definitions in your own notes into one spot. So they can, they're easy to see, they're easy to spot, and it's easy for you to go like, okay, wait, what is the C over here? Oh, right, okay, C is defined to be blah, blah, and blah, blah, okay? So I would put all those definitions together in your own notes. You don't have to do it during class. You know, this is the kind of stuff that you can do preferably before class, but if you do it after class, it is good also. You can also download the source material for this uh, material here. It is OER, so you do have the permission to do it. And then you can use either color coding, you can put a box on this side you know, th that really emphasize, okay, these are the definitions that we need to understand. You know, so you can do any of those things. The easiest way is to use a piece of paper and a pen. So it's entirely up to you to determine how you want to take notes in this class. I can only say that taking notes is important because otherwise the definition of the symbols are scattered. Now, do I intend, did I intend to scatter the definitions all over the place? No, because the scattering has to do with, I'm trying to explain why each one, what each one is doing and why it is there. So that's why they're kind of scattered because there are a lot of connection pieces of explanation. But from your perspective, once you understand the explanation, your focus is really go like, I just have to remember what it is. That's why you, you want to put them all together so it's easier to look up. Is that okay? So this is me trying to tell you guys how to prepare your, um, what is it again? Um, study guide for your exam, okay? Because you, know, you can come up with your own study guide. And so can ChatGPT, by the way. You, know, you can ask, actually ask you know, ChatGPT to, <coughs> to come up with, with a study guide. Okay, so now we are going to base two addition. You go like, okay, so we are done with base 10 already. So the end of the base 10 discussion is a structure. So let me see if I can put all of those in the same window. <coughs> okay, they're all in the same window right now. So this thing here, the definition of R, the definition of C, 
how q of i is using r to relate x i y i, how s of i is using r to relate q i k i, and how c is used to relate k of i plus one, which is the k of the next column, to x i y i q i k i, that is the structure. So the question is, do we have any questions about this structure based on your understanding of base 10 multi-digit addition? You did, okay. Then the next question is, ah, okay, now we have to deal with base two. What are we gonna do? It's, it's, it's easy in a way, but it's also hard in a way. Because you know, the first thing we do is, um, what about just redefining things so that they work on every base, okay? We just say it's a base B. Oh, that's easy. Because R of UV in base B is just U plus V mod B. Because it's the same reasoning. We have one digit here in base B. We have another digit here in base B. We calculate the sum. If the sum is greater than or equal to the base, then we go like, oh, we don't have a single digit that can represent the quantity. Hey, the next digit, can you help me take care of B out of the actual sum? That's a carry of one. But after that carry of one, we have taken care of the quantity of B out of the actual sum. What do I have left over? That's just U plus V mod B. That's the other way to express it, right? So the approach works in base 10, but it also works regardless of what base <coughs> you choose to use. The idea is just the idea. Base 10 is just what we are familiar with. Is that okay? Because this is actually a very important step because I tend to use this approach a lot in my classes, is to start with something that you are overwhelmingly familiar with and go like, okay, this is it. This is what you're familiar with. Let's do it once. And then I'll extract the structure out of it, typically starting with naming the individual components that I need to refer to. And then I go look at all of these things, okay? So in this case, I have X0, X1, y, X2, Y0, Y1, Y2, and so on and so forth. Then I look at those and go like, okay, now how do those things relate to each other? Can I come up with a formula that can, ex that can explain how these multi different digits relate to each other? That is how I came up with R and C because you know, they're just functions to help me with all this. The C on the other hand, which is determining whether we have a carry of one or a carry of zero, before we were comparing to 10, now we just have to compare to B, whatever B is. B can be 10 in base 10, can be seven in base seven, and so on, because it's the same concept. Are we good so far? Because all I did right now at this point is to generalize the 10 from the previous one to B, which is whatever base we're supposed to work with. You good so far? All right. <coughs> so when this is done, then we go like, Okay, so I have abstracted everything to the most abstract level, and now we are, re we are making a specific case of the abstraction, which is, oh, I know what base we want to work with. I want to work with base two. So what do we do in base two? Oh, B is just two, right? Yeah, so all we have to do is just say, oh, B is two. So now we can just say R of UV is U plus V mod two. It was mod 10 before, then it was mod B, you know, when we try to abstract it to the extreme, and now we make it more specific and go like, oh, we don't care about base three or base seven, those are really strange bases. We only care about base two. Well, base two equals two, we're done. Same thing with carry. You just have to look at the sum of the two single digits and ask, is that greater than or equal to two? If it is, then you have a carry of one, otherwise you have a carry of zero. Are we good so far? it, okay? So that is basically all we have to do to convert it into base two. But there's a little bit of a problem. I'll explain that later. The first thing that uh, we need to look at is, um, but this doesn't help me build the circuit. The, the reason why it doesn't help me build the circuit is I still need arithmetic addition. And the whole idea is I want to build a circuit to do addition. So this is circular reasoning, right? You know, because you know, I cannot say, I want to build a circuit using addition, but in that circuit, there's addition as an operator. 
that doesn't work because you know, I'm trying to figure out how to use transistors, the P and the N type transistors, to make the circuit. Okay, that's one problem. Mod is even more evil because mod is division and division is not easy. Okay, so I have to go like, ah, okay, I cannot do this with a circuit because I have complicated arithmetic operations. There's a comparison here also, which I also don't know how to do. Okay, so I go like, ah, well, let, let's, let's take a step back, okay? Because when we deal with base two, the nice thing is I can spell out all the cases super easily, right? Because in the case of C of U, V in base two, U is a single digit in base two, V is also a single, single digit in base two. What possibilities do I have for each one of these? Zero and one, because it's in base two. So I can spell out all the cases very easily in a table. Because when U is zero, V can be zero of one. When U is one, V can also be zero of one. I have spelled out every single possible case. Now, can I do something like this in base 10? Yes. But how many rows am I going to end up with? 100, because it's 10 times 10. Because for every single digit of u, there are 10 possibilities for v. So we have 10 times 10, which is 100. I mean, yes, it is still a table, but it's a very long table. This one is super easy. OK, base 2 is easy. So you look at this table. If I don't tell you that the rightmost column is C of UV, what do you think it looks like? Looks like and, conjunction, okay? Because false and false is false, false and true is false, true and false is false, true and true is the only time you get true back. Go like, huh, convenient, don't you think? Because now we can say, forget about adding and comparing and all that crap. We can just do a logical and when it is base two. Only when it is in base two. Are we good so far? The next question is, but wait, Tech, you know, your whole objective is to build a circuit to do this. Can we perform logical and using a circuit? Now, you may not remember exactly how to do it. I certainly hope that you still remember because that's what the lab, the previous lab, was all about. But I hope you remember at least the fact that, oh, yeah, we can build it. We can build a NAND2, and then we use NAND2 to build the AND. Okay, cool. We got one problem solved, okay? The whole thing about carry can be done with a logical gate. We good so far? Can you see the direction I'm heading? Okay. So now we look at... R, okay? So R is a little bit kind of funkier, right? Because you know, zero, it, when U and V are zeros, then R of U, V is a zero. Uh, when at least what, when exactly one of the two is a one, then the result is a one. When both are ones, the result is also a zero. This table is done by using the traditional definition of R, which is U plus V, the whole thing, mod two. Well, let's double check because I'm known to make errors, okay? No behavior errors. Zero plus zero is a zero. Zero mod two is a zero. Okay. Zero plus one is one. One mod two is a one. One plus zero is one. One mod two is also one. One plus one is a two. Two mod two is a two. Okay, so we got that. So you look at this table and go like, uh, it looks like an or, except it with an actual or, which is a disjunction. The last row would have given us a one because you know, true or true is also a true. It's like. Ugh almost got it but not exactly so there are multiple ways to uh, deal with this one um, there are multiple expressions um, but this by itself can be used it, it can use uh, exclusive or as an operator okay now we haven't really talked about how to uh, translate exclusive or which is exactly what this table is into transistors but in mathematics there is an operator called exclusive or and the symbol for exclusive or is a plus with a circle. Are we good so far? That's just how it is defined. This is the exclusive or definition. So for those of you go like, but tech, that doesn't really help because you know, we do not, we have not talked about how to express exclusive or 
using NAND2 gates because you know, the NAND2 is the simplest gate that we can make out of P and N transistors. So we go like, okay, well, we can kind of expand that a little bit. We can turn it into this expression here. So when you look at this expression, do you recognize all the operators in C? Yep, okay. This is U and not V or not U and V. And then the rest is really just coercing the Boolean result into ones and zeros. Well, can we perform negation using NAND? That's what we did last Thursday. So the labs are actually important because you know the labs are hands-on, but at the same time, it is also explaining or reinforcing some of the theoretical stuff that we talked about in class. Can we perform logical AND using NAND? Yep, that's the other circuit that we worked on you know, last Thursday. Can we perform OR? Well, we didn't quite do that circuit, but according to the notes, yes, we can. So that means this entire thing can be done using a lot of transistors, okay? I'm not saying this is gonna be simple as a circuit using transistors. The question is, can it be done using transistors? And the, the answer is, yes, we can. Is that okay? So we took care of expressing C using transistors. We took care of um, using transistors to implement R. So the only thing left is the addition of this 2C to make K of I plus one. So that's the only thing left. So the only thing left is that, okay, is you know, basically how we calculate K of I plus one because we know how to perform the C function here using transistors. It's just a regular AND. Using two NAND gates, we can do this. Um, we also took care of this part here, which is also the same kind of circuit, but applied to QI and KI. What we are not sure about is this addition here. This is an arithmetic addition, which means one plus one, one plus one is two. But one or one is one. So I would like to use OR, okay, but I also noticed that OR and addition are not exactly the same because when U and V are both ones, then the two operators will give me two different answers. So then I go like, wait, but can this row actually happen? In other words, can C of X, I, Y, I and C of Q, I, K, I, can they both be ones at the same time? Because if that is not possible, then I go like, hey, the last row is not gonna happen anyway. So for all the rows that can actually happen, we are the same. Is that okay? Is everybody kind of still following my reasoning? Okay. So now I have to say, can I mathematically prove that the last row cannot possibly happen? When C of X, I, Y, I is a one, C of Q, I, K, I is guaranteed a zero, and vice versa. When Q, C of Q, I, K, I is a one, it is guaranteed that C of X, I, Y, I is a zero. So the key here is Q of I is not an independent bit. In other words, the value of Q of I is not independent to X, I, Y, I, because Q of I is defined as is the single digit sum of X, I, Y, I, that's right. So there's our restriction, that's our ticket out of this little problem here, okay? So just think about it, okay? We're just gonna think about it in any base, actually, but in base two, it's super easy to think about. When X, I, and Y, I is true, what do you know about X, I, Y, I? This is specific to the binary case, when X, I is a one, Y, I is a one, C of X, I, Y, I is gonna be a one. But that means X, I, and Y, I, they both have to be ones, okay? When X, I, Y, I are both ones, what is Q, I in base two? We saw that table a little earlier. When U and V are both ones, R of U, V is a zero, that's right. So if one side of C is a zero guaranteed, it doesn't matter what K of I is. Because zero plus either a one or a zero cannot trigger a carry. Does that make sense? 
So, okay, so I've handled one of the two directions. If C of xi, yi is a one, then we can now guarantee that C of qi, ki cannot be a one. It has to be a zero. All right? What about the other way around? What if C of qi, ki is a one? What does that tell me about qi, ki? They both have to be, they both have to be one. Very good. So that means q of i is a one. What value of x i y i will force q of i to be one? Zero, one or one zero. In other words, x i y i they have to be different. One of them has to be a one. The other one has to be a zero. Does that make sense? Wait. If at least one of them is a zero, then the conjunction is zero. So that means C of x i y i in phase two cannot be a one when C of q i k i is already a one. That concludes the informal proof. Okay, that's the last row here. Okay, the row that I just wrote off. This row here cannot possibly happen. So if that row cannot happen, the other three rows are the same. So that means oh, so instead of using the addition here, I can just do use an or. So that solved all my problems. Because I can use an or instead of the addition, and then C of the C function is already just a conjunction, and then the R function is kind of a long one, but it only involves your negation, disjunction, and conjunction. So now I can do everything using logic gates or logical operators. And every logical operator that we use here, which is negation, conjunction, and disjunction, each and every single one of those can be implemented using NAND gates. And a NAND gate uses two P and two N transistors. So we can now implement the entire thing using transistors. Is it gonna be a big mess of transistors? Yes. But we only care about can we do it? The answer is yes, we can do it. Is that okay so far? All right. So I'm going to take roll. Yes, go ahead. There's a question in the back. So this man is a, uh, of two reasons. One, this is one of the simplest things that we can design. We can only do four transitions, two N and two P. So that's what reason number one. Reason number two is man can also be used to implement all of the other logical operations that we care about. So those are the two reasons. into that kind of technology, you can see how you know, why man and more are really important gates in computer engineering. In computer science, people don't care. Okay, in, in computer science, we're only concerned about the logical operators that are supported by programming languages. So C, C++, Java, and so on. They only support the ones that we typically use, which is negation, conjunction, and disjunction. But when you get down to the transistor level, then it is the NAND and the NOR that are more common because they are the, the simplest ones to implement and all we need to do is to configure how they connect to each other and then we can perform complicated operations. So those are very good questions, I like those. Any other questions about addition? Okay, so we'll take a short break. I'm gonna take a roll, okay, I haven't really enabled 
what we're taking yet. So I'm gonna take a little bit of time here. So you can have a little bit of time to kind of catch up with your note taking and write down the stuff that you need to write down. Um, I'm gonna reuse this one here and I'm gonna put it down here. Just give me a second to do all the changes. Zero nine, oops, zero three. And I also need to change the due date and all that. So the uh, access code is octopus, but you cannot see it yet. Okay, so give me a, just a little bit more time to finish this up. I'm gonna try that. Nope, doesn't like it. <laughs> That'll be cool. Um, I'll give you guys until like 10, 20 to do it. Plenty of time. September 3rd, 10, 20 AM. So you can publish. You should be able to see it now. And then the access code is just octopus. I'll write it on the whiteboard. I'll give you guys a few minutes to do it. I think most of you are done with this. All right, so we can go back and continue with binary addition and subtraction. So we go to subtraction. There we go. And it's already here. All right, do we have any questions about binary addition and how we started off with something that we are familiar with, which is multi-digit base 10 addition. And then we uh, started to name the individual digits. And then I tried to figure out the relationship between the digits and go like, oh, okay, here's the structure between the, the digits. And then the only thing, yeah, go ahead. Oh, Q is 991, yeah. yes, you're so correct. Q is the answer to that is 991. Uh-huh. So one carries over from 9 plus 2 is 11. Um, why K and 32 for a paragraph? Because there's no one contributing a 1 here. There's no prior addition to the right-hand side of column 0. Okay. Yep. So in that case, you say it, it, there has to be an underwear, so I can do it. Well, somebody has to contribute to it. You know, this would be technically this is k zero, so it would rely on k. It would rely on x of negative one, y of negative one, q of negative one, and k of negative one. But since I have no digits over here, so nobody is contributing one to k of zero. Yep. All right. So, are we ready for subtraction, or do we have any additional questions about addition? All right, so I do have to kind of mention that there are many cases where I've heard people saying, when you explain it, everything makes sense, but when I try to read this material and try to figure this out, I have no idea what is happening in the, in the notes. So that means you, know, you have to use multiple pathway to understand and establish the connections between these things. Listening to me is one, Reading the material is different because when you're listening versus when you're reading, different pathways. When you write notes about this, it's yet another pathway. And when you try to talk to another person and explain the concepts, it is yet another pathway. They're all related, but they're not exactly the same. So it really helps when you guys have study groups and you try to explain to each other your understanding of the material. 
One, it gives you a chance to verbally try to explain something, exercising that particular pathway. Two, the other person can try to validate whether your understanding is correct or not, or can cross-check with each other. If you guys are not sure, as a study group, what do you do? Come to my office hour, which is right after this class at noon. All right? Yep. You did, you were going <laughs> to, uh, good, okay, very good. Um, the Mesa Center has tutors, typically, who can help you with this class. Does everybody know where to find the Mesa Center? First floor, right next to the STEM home base. Okay, so they typically have tutors who have already taken this class. So if you need some additional help or just want to confirm your understanding of the material, as long as you are eligible as either the MESA member, a MESA member or an ASAN member, then you are eligible to get tutoring in the center. Uh, MESA, M-E-S-A, requires that you meet both requirements, which is first generation college student and you're receiving some form of financial aid. ASAM, which is MESA spelled backwards, means you, know, you have just one of the two requirements met. The difference is, as a full uh, MESA member, you can also go on to field trips and other things that the MESA Center organizes. As an ASAM member, you can only get the tutoring part, but not the, uh, I guess, you know, the field trips and the other stuff. But it's a really great resource. Um, if you're good at this material and you say, okay, but I have taken calculus one and two, I can tutor those classes. Instead of being a member, you can be a tutor at the Mesa Center. Why do you want to be a, ma a tutor at the Mesa Center? Okay, can someone give me some idea? Because I don't want to be the one who's talking, I want you guys to think about things too. Why do you want to become a tutor at the Mesa Center? What are the two motivators, the two biggest motivators to become a tutor? It looks good on the resume, but I'm gonna go, I, I will go for the first one. You get paid, <laughs> which is good, right? And you don't have to go off campus. You're in the STEM building. You can go there, be a tutor, kind of in between your classes, and get paid for it. That's one, okay? It's the first reason that most people like myself would think of, but there's a second reason too. You get to hang out with other people and the other students of Mesa. Why do you want to do that? Sorry? Networking. networking. So why are those people the same kind of people that you want to network with? I'll give you an observation. Almost every person, okay, tutee or tutor in the Mesa Center are transfer students in some kind of STEM field. Computer science actually makes up the majority. So you'll be talking to your peers who also have plans to transfer. Now, where they transfer to may not be the same as what you, where you want to transfer to, but they, you're, you guys are all going through the same process. Okay, so you can exchange information. Okay, how do I get this process started? Which school accepts, uh, what is it, the pre-agreement of your know, acceptance? There's a name for that. Not I get to, it's uh, do you guys know what I'm talking about? You can talk to an admission person from, say, UC Davis. They look at your current GPA, and they go like, okay, we, you're conditionally accepted as long as you can keep the GPA to be at this level. There's a name for that. What is it? Huh? Say again? TAG, a transfer agreement, right? Yeah. So you can talk to your peers about which school, which program, has transfer agreement and which ones do not. I can tell you right away, computer science is too hard. Most universities do not have transfer agreement. They will take your application and then they will rank your application you know, amongst you know, all of the applications and they just talk to, they take the first bunch, they offer to those people first and then when they get rejection from the students or the applicants, then they start to move down the list so you know, sometimes you cannot even know whether you'll be accepted until what, July, okay? So knowing you know, these differences, which school, which program has transfer agreement and which ones do not have transfer agreement because all, everybody's co collecting information. So when you guys exchange that information, everybody benefits. That is the second 
and I think more important reason to become a tutor at the Mesa Center. So you can say, but I haven't taken a lot of programming classes. Then don't tutor those programming classes. If you have already passed and you know, aced you know, Calc 1 and 2, just tutor cal Calc 1, 2, and 3. If it's just Calc 1, fine, just Calc 1 then. Okay? So I'm just telling you guys, you know, that's, this is a really good resource you know, that we have available on this campus, in this building, in this very same building. All right, we, do have, we have another five minutes to talk about subtraction. It's easy, because the only thing about subtraction is, oh, instead of an addition, we have a subtraction. Instead of a single digit sum, we have a single digit difference, okay? Instead of a carry, we have a borrow. That's it, okay? So we'll take a look at this example. You know, we, mo we don't have a whole lot of time, but I think if I can get you guys started started to think about this, the next time, which is Thursday, when we talk about this, you guys are like, yeah, we, we know the flow already. We, we can make all the connections. So now we have one minus four. One minus four is technically negative three. But we don't have a single digit that to represent negative three. So what do we do? We use the same idea. Instead of saying, oh, it's negative three, we say, well, this quantity is less than zero. We cannot represent anything that is less than zero using a single digit. We go like, why don't you, which is one, I'm borrowing 10 from you. Is that okay? Because you know, I don't have enough to, you know, to carry on the subtraction of four, so I'm gonna borrow 10 from you. So now you have what? You have your original one plus the 10 that you borrowed. You have 11. 11 is greater than or equal to four, we're good. What is 11 minus four? Six. Seven, okay? Ah, you got a seven here. That's the single digit difference, okay? It is after, if you need to, borrow. What about the borrow? Well, we have a borrow here, because we have to remember, this is kind of like the tab at a bar, okay? It's like, I don't have cash today, can I just you know, you know, put it on the tab? Yes, you just put it on the tab. Are we good so far? How do we get to seven? Seven minus zero has a single digit difference of seven. That's it, okay? So this borrow can come from x minus y, but this borrow can also come from zero minus one. Just like with addition, there are two ways to end up with a borrow. In the case of addition, there are two ways to end up with a carry of one. Is that okay? So what is the main difference? The main difference is, I'm just gonna jump to the actual equations here. So this time, your R of UV, which is the single digit difference, is now computed by whatever base we're dealing with plus one of the digit minus the other digit. Because this sum here, 10 plus U, is guaranteed to be enough for the subtraction. Are we good so far? And then the, uh, we don't have a carry, we have a borrow, so this is a typo, I'll fix it. The borrow is simply asking, we don't even care about what base we're dealing with, because as long as u as a single digit is less than v as a single digit, the quantity or the actual difference is gonna be negative, which means we're gonna have the borrow. Okay, that pretty much is the only difference. And then when, you re when we express the relationship between the digits, they look awfully similar, okay? So instead of having the s of i, we have the p of i, which is the difference, and then instead of k of i plus one and k of i, we have t or k of a. Okay, just because you know, that's the because b is already used as the name of a function, I cannot use b you know, as the name of a digit, so I use t. But otherwise, do you recognize the structure to be like, huh, almost the same? It's just the way we calculate r and the way we calculate b are different from the way we calculate r and c in the case of addition. So you can probably guess that you know the next thing we do is we generalize to base b and go like, okay, we can do with base b, but since b is already the name of a function, we have to use you know, e as the base. Um, but anyway, the structure is the same, okay? You know, and I still have to fix you know, all the references to c to b because I copied and pasted and forgot to change some of those. That's fine. But 
So this is for you guys to read, okay, you know, over the next day and a half or so. And then on Thursday, we're going to go over the subtraction stuff. And then we'll have a lab that actually deals with binary addition on Thursday, okay? So read this before class, okay? It is really important to read something before class and then jot down any questions that you might have. And then we have the lab today. I will, do, I will uh, release the lab for today and then I'll go fix the notes myself right away. So today's lab is base conversion. So it is before the module from your perspective. So let me just release it, make sure that it, the time is correct, and then give you the access code. So the access code is heptapod. So what is a heptapod? Heptapod. What is it? Seven. Seven, okay, hepta is seven, and what is pod? Leg, limbs, okay? So a heptopod is basically kind of like an octopus, except hepta instead of octo. <coughs> it comes from a movie. Which movie has heptopods? Aliens that has that have seven limbs. Hmm? Alien? No, alien, actually, they have the same number of limbs as the original uh, organism that they mess up. <laughs> they mutate. Which movie? This is a movie that has non-violent aliens, for once. Arrival. Arrival, that is correct, is, which is a great movie, too. So Heptapod is the uh, access code. You should be able to get into it now. It is due at 11.50 AM. And to do this one, you might want to use a calculator. You, know, you can use a calculator that is online. You can use your TI-84 or whatever calculator that you carry with you, or you can just use paper and pencil. I mean, the math is not super hard to do. All right, so I am going to fix my notes right away because all the C function should be B function for subtraction. So I'm going to do my little thing here. You can watch me do this, or you can just do work in the lab. Or take a short break before you work in the lab.
he'll be back in a few minutes.
in the lab, if the answer to a question is zero, Kansas will give you a false positive of telling you that you have not answered the question. You can just ignore that as permitted. Because Canvas has a bug where it would interpret an answer of zero as not answered. 